Hi and welcome to Girls and Filter podcast. I'm Megs and I'm Emma and on this podcast we talk about your boy dilemmas, issues with the girlies and how to be a gorgeous bitch in general. Sometimes we're even joined by cute guests. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Stay sexy. Hi guys and welcome back to Girls and Filtered. Today we've got a really exciting. You usually say welcome, welcome. Yeah, I know. I'm all out of <laughs> um, um, today we've got a really exciting guest on the pod. We've got Deputy Louise O'Reilly. Hello, Louise. How are you? How are you? Lovely to be here. Lovely to meet you. And um, so we're going to talk to Louise about the mental health services in Ireland, and we want to talk to her about what it's like being a female in politics, and um, and how she got into politics and her story. So um, I suppose a bit more to you about like housing and businesses and stuff like yeah. that as well, if you don't mind. We've yeah. got a rant. They're all quite like random, <laughs> to be honest. But yeah, we've got a lot of I'm questions. Sure we'll be able to them all. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I will. I will. Oh, I um, but we'll try and get through as much as we can because we only have an hour. So, um, but tell us about yourself, Louise, growing up, and um, how you got into politics. Okay, so before I was elected or before I got kind of politically active, I worked as a full time trade union official. So my job was essentially representing people. Um, I got into that. Well, I suppose I got into that because I, I, I could see what was happening at the level of the workplace and the need to get organized and, and get unionized. But, you know, my, my dad was a union official, so I knew the job. Um, he was a union leader, not in the union that I was in now, but uh, he, he was a trade union leader already. So I knew the job and I went in there. Um, and I loved that work. Absolutely loved it. I was hugely passionate about it, representing uh, nurses and healthcare workers, um, you know, and people really on the absolute front line. Um, and then like, over time, I kind of realized that, yeah, it was good to be able to change things at the level of the workplace. And that's that's really important. And I and I and I loved that work. But I kind of felt like I needed to kick it up a level um, and, you know, that that really what was required was political change, national change, you know, to, to actually deliver uh, for workers. Um, I've, I've always been a Republican. Uh, I spent, despite my Dublin accent, I spent uh, 10 years living in uh, a border town. So I, I, I know uh, all about partition. So there was never going to be any other party other than Sinn Féin that I would join. And I'd been a member for a while and I decided then, yeah, I'm going to get active. And then as a result of that I got into the electoral politics but you know I mean I'm in I'm in politics because I see the world for what it is and I want to change it that's yeah. it's really as simple as that you know and it's the same as it, like the work of representing people is the work I did previously uh, when I was the union official but this obviously is is on the, the next level up uh, so to speak so that was it was kind of a, it was a fairly natural progression to go from one to the other um I think uh, although there aren't that many union officials in uh, in the Dáil, in fact, there's only myself and uh, Deputy Kathleen Function in the Dáil, and then there's uh, Senator Paul Gavin in the in the Shannon, and the, we're all in Sinn Féin, and three of us were previously uh, trade union organisers. So you know, but it is a kind of a to me, it seems like a very natural uh, progression, you know. Mm, definitely. And what's it like being a female then in the Dáil? Well, you see. I'm very used to male dominated environments. The union was very male dominated, uh, very much. It's, it's less so now, actually, uh, than it was when I came into it, but very, very heavily male dominated. And the doll is the same. But the lucky thing for me is that my party's not like that. So like the, the doll is is made up of uh, mostly men. Um, obviously majority men in Sinn Féin as well but we have one third women and 100% of our leadership uh, are women so we have Mary Lou and, uh, and Michelle O'Neill they make up our leadership so for for me my experience in the doll is is very it's it's very black and white so I have the experience of being in Sinn Féin which is a place where it's fantastic to be a woman we have a woman leader being a woman is not is not an issue and then you have uh, the 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 doll and the chamber and and that can be challenging but you know like when I was working in the union my boss uh, I, I got a, a promotion and he he said well you know congratulations now Louise <laughs> you're going to get to work twice as hard for half the recognition of the men and I thought Jesus what am I doing this for yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, that shouldn't be this hard yeah. but so it can be a little bit like that you know you can get um 
there's a yeah there's a fair amount of of uh, of misogyny and sort of casual sexism that happens uh, in the doll but i don't think it's any different to to any workplace to be honest with you um yeah. you get heckled a, a little bit that can be a bit disconcerting um you got to learn to shout back uh, mm. and then some people say that you know that there are like that before you even get into the doll there's barriers for women entering yeah. politics you know and and all of this when, when people say if you can't see it you can't be it like that's really true you look at politics and you look at the press conferences even during the pandemic you have Eamon Ryan, Leo Varadkar, Micheál Martin you don't see women uh, you know very much they don't put women to, to the forefront certainly in, in either Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael they, they, I can't think even of any sort of prominent women uh, that are there that are out for them all of the time you know so it, it can be tough but as I say my experience is kind of twofold my experience in the party very very positive my experience in the doll less so but I think it's pretty much the same as every workplace it's uh, you know it's changing but it's not changing fast enough yeah absolutely and I think that would definitely like you're right when you say it's the same in many workplaces across the board like in an office environment I was in an office and you can definitely you can definitely feel it sometimes um but i suppose it's different in politics because you're kind of public facing and um, you're in the media and i feel like that could put women off going into politics yeah um what would you say to that well i would say don't let that put you off get in and change it um you know for god's sake like the 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 the, the idea that it's an off-putting place for women is that that's actually the biggest reason why we should have more women in politics yeah, yeah. even though that makes it more scary if you see what I mean so yeah I mean it is tough and, and like sometimes like I find myself kind of saying well, I don't want to talk about this I don't want to talk about what it's like to be a woman because I'm a politician I'm ju- I, you know I want people to yeah. just meet me where I am and not go well they, she's a female politician or you know yeah. that, that's a male politician and and I think sometimes that we can get a little bit as as women uh, in politics we can get a little bit distracted by that as well mm-hmm. what we need to do is simply affect the change that we need you know make those changes happen if there are changes that are required and also ensure that our own parties because I mean most most people in the dollar in a political party like we need to make sure that our political parties are as welcoming for uh, for women as Sinn Féin is you know and, and that women ha- can aspire to positions of leadership in uh, within those parties and you know it, it does sometimes I like some of it's rotten toxic stuff but it's not I don't you, you get more of it in the public eye uh you know you, you get more of that abuse on social media and stuff like that but yeah. I would hope that you know women looking in from the outside would would maybe come and talk to female politicians rather than just looking on social media and saying my god everyone's saying her hair is manky that's just awful I wouldn't like that or everyone's mm-hmm. saying such and such like, I don't see a lot of that stuff I know that that people have opinions about my hair about my voice about how I look if my bum is big if it's tiny <laughs> if whatever like yeah. everybody has an opinion and I'm lucky in as much as I I kind of don't care you know I mean mm-hmm. it's hurtful uh you see some of the stuff I got a lovely picture sent to me the other day comparing me to um a weightlifter who was not a very attractive man much less a, a woman uh mm-hmm. and you know it was like kind of looking at going well I suppose I do look a little bit like that person <laughs> they do have long hair and I, they, I don't look unlike them they have brown hair they have blue eyes but then I was kind of looking at the shape of them going and I recently started running again I don't think I'm quite that shape oh, but you do you get Terrible. a bit of that and I I very rarely see it um when I'm lucky when I have filters on all my social media I don't see an awful lot of it but yeah. sometimes uh and there's a couple um there's a couple of my uh sort of uh, regular corresponders uh, now my um, PA that I work with um he he's fantastic he would filter out a lot of that stuff out of my email so I don't I don't generally see it but mm. uh, I saw some of it there a couple of weeks ago it's a guy that, that emails me literally every time I'm on RTA right not not any other program but on RTA to go well you were an absolute disgrace there O'Reilly wait around <laughs> and he, he has such strong feelings about me and yeah. I really feel like you know I'd, I'd love to maybe have a conversation with them and go why do you watch those programs why do yeah. you listen to the radio if I'm on if it makes you so angry yeah. if there was something yeah. on the tv I'm sitting in my living room now if something came on the television there that really made me as angry as this man gets about me I would genuinely turn it off yeah I, just, I wouldn't be able to put myself through it like <laughs> yeah that's we are dying to find a troll that we can have on like an internet troll because I've got a youtube channel and yeah the comments that I get and the comments that other people get 
are crazy like people care so much about other people's lives that they've never met they've never but that's the thing and if they passed you on the street they wouldn't say it yeah you know if 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 you pass that person I mean that that this man and like well I have his email address and everything like he's not Mm. trying to hide who he is he just has really strong opinions about my voice and about how I look and about whether or not I should be always wearing a suit or if I wear like I'm a big dubs fan so if I'm working on a Saturday or Sunday if I'm going to a match after you might be out in RTE doing something I'll have my jersey on because I'm going (laughs) to the game afterwards I mean we have a bit of respect for the office you know it's a Saturday you know I'm allowed to have some time off like I'm a t-shirt on me now I wear a suit to work most of the time but you know people I I kind of look at that and go I couldn't I don't have those kind of strong opinions about what I wear myself much less what other people uh, wear and I would love to actually have a chat with that man and say to him just just give yourself a day off if you see it coming up on social media that I'm going to be on RT or something just don't watch it Joe, don't yeah, do it yeah. to yourself. You know? yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think that some, you know, they they uh, they obviously have another agenda. Most of the time, what's at the back of it is politics. It's not, it's not actually that personal. Like the stuff that they say is personal, but what's motivating it is generally politics. And yeah. I kind of think I went through the Eighth Amendment as a as a very prominent person in the party, very prominent in the in the repeal campaign because mm-hmm. it meant a huge amount to me huge amount to me. I put an awful lot of effort into it yeah. but I I kind of feel like if I, I went through the worst of it then so anything that comes after that now is just yeah, yeah it'll happen yeah. but it's, it. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah it's unpleasant but it's you know and as my mother would say or my grandmother if she was alive when it reflects more on them than it does on you and Absolutely. they're right yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. dead right yeah. Absolutely. you kind of just have to separate yourself from it as well mm-hmm. you know because if you read every comment and that affects you sure you no yeah. one would do anything no, yeah you know you never or you do you'd never be able to get dressed because there's literally mm-hmm. nothing I own that that, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. that would that would you know pass yeah. muster I'd never be able to open my mouth as well because my <laughs> voice is very triggering for some people as well as the Dublin yeah. accent I think people don't like it um yeah so I I would yeah if you if you read it all or if you took any of it seriously mm-hmm. I mean you you would actually you would be in a set and the thing that worries me most is that like young women who are thinking about a career in politics, who are looking at the world around them going, Jesus, I want to work to make this better. I want to change mm-hmm. this, that they would open up Twitter and have a look and say, oh, no, I'm not signing up for that. I don't, you know, I, I like the, I want to do the policy stuff. I want to do the doll. I want to do whatever it is in terms of representation. And I want to be involved in that, but I'm not signing up for having yeah. someone, you know, measuring my backside every 10 minutes yeah. or commenting on my hair. And the, if that was off-putting for women, that's why I would say, you know, particularly to, to, to the young women who are following you guys, like, mm. come and talk to politicians if you want to know what it's really like. Yeah. Like that stuff on Twitter, it, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, they're, they're just nasty people, but they wouldn't have the nerve to say it to you if they passed you in the street. Oh, absolutely not. No way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, would, you know, I mean, I, my daughter used to work in, um, She's working in retail a couple of years ago and one of the so things in their social media policy was like if you put something on social media that is about one of your co-workers imagine your mother coming into the canteen and reading it out to everybody mm-hmm. if you're not happy for her to do that don't post it on social media I always thought that was kind of good because these people wouldn't have the courage or the nerve to come up they'd pass you in the street and they'd be Ooh, you know they wouldn't yeah. they wouldn't look directly at you whereas you know they're very brave behind their uh, anonymity oh, yeah. and you know yeah. and, and whatever on on social media and on on email and stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah definitely keyboard warriors yes that's, that's it yeah. that's exactly um, it but speaking of social media and trolls, and obviously that has effect on mental health, that kind of leads us nicely into the mental health part of yeah. the conversation. Yeah. Um, what is your thoughts on the mental health services in Ireland? They're very lacking. Um, and I think we have, in the last maybe five to ten years, we have broken down some of the barriers in terms of people being able to talk um, about the state of their mental health, be it good or bad. Yeah. You know, that that's, you know, today I'm 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 feeling good, but tomorrow I might not be, you know, and mm-hmm. I think people are much better at doing that. The problem comes when a person needs help and they reach out and that help is not there. And mm-hmm. that I mean, I deal with that in my I have two constituency offices. I've one in Swords and I've one in Balbriggan. We have the youngest and fastest growing population of any uh, constituency on the island. So for me, it's a huge amount of work being done in relation to child and adolescent mental health services. And you're just spending days advocating for people to get really basic 
services and you see situations uh, used to be an advert on telly uh, a couple of years ago and the, it was for an insurance company but the tagline was don't turn a drama into a crisis and you see crisis developing in people's lives where where they don't need to where a small amount of support at a at a kind of maybe talk and therapies would help that the situation escalates because the support is not there like I've had parents come to me who are afraid of their own kids and then they're afraid to say to me that they're afraid of their kids and their kids aren't out of control they simply need the intervention and the assistance of a mental health professional but when you're told you have to wait three years for an assessment you know I mean we wait for an assessment of need in North County Dublin uh, the wait is over three years for uh, access to services for child and adolescent mental health services if you're not an emergency and this is the other thing it's only when there's an emergency so when when you are in crisis then you get a small amount of intervention sometimes but then the follow-up is lacking so people don't get a chance to get well and I think that's that that is a big failing because actually we all have periods in our life where we need a little bit of help. And, and if it's your physical, like if you if you break your leg and you have to walk on a crutch, nobody says, you know, they, they, you know no, nobody says, oh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait a couple of years for that crutch. You, you get the crutch, you need it. It's, it's a physical need and you get it. Whereas when it's mental health, people kind of think, oh yeah, well, you can wait, you know? So I yeah. think we've spent a long time, like if, like cast my mind back when I was working in the union, I used to represent psychiatric nurses and like they would have spent a huge amount of their time just advocating for really basic services for the people that they were trying to look after. But when the government closed the big psychiatric hospitals, which was the right thing to do I, I fully agree with that but when they closed them down they were supposed to replace them with services in the community and they didn't so people who ha- are having episodes of mental ill health they find themselves homeless they find themselves in prison mm-hmm. simply because at that moment they can't cope that doesn't mean they're you, you write them off forever it just mm-hmm. means right here right now I need a hand and I can't get it and therefore you, you know it, it spirals and I've seen people who have ended up in addiction, have ended up in homeless, uh, at homeless services, and all because they maybe needed a little bit of help. But then the situation develops into a crisis and lives are getting destroyed because we have a a mental ill health uh, pandemic effectively at the moment, which it like it it is heartbreaking and it, it's it's hard to kind of separate out one group from another. But I I know in in my office and I know Marion that works with me she will tell you it's children and it's it's that kind of age group around the sort of 15 to 20 you know that's what you're not you're not a child when you're 20 I don't mean it's that but it's younger people yeah. it's, that, it's that kind of 15 to 20 age group mm-hmm. where very often it's a a low level intervention that might be required yeah but it's just not there and there's nobody there to so we spend like a huge amount of time writing to the minister for health saying look can we just get basic services mm. for these that they don't have to wait for and it's the, you see i think the waiting is causing the problem and then on the other end of the spectrum you, you find people ending up in accident and emergency um at, at that's at the extreme end but you know mm accident and emergency is no place for a person who is having a mental health crisis. I mean, I, I know A&Es, I, I know them because I, I worked representing the nurses in them up and down the, the country. They're chaotic places at the best of times. They are the place where you need to be for a short period of time, get triaged, get as what they say, treated or streeted, uh, you know, that you need to be admitted or you're gone. And, you know, all of that, like it's fast moving. It's no place for yeah. a person who is having a mental health crisis. And yet, I think we probably all know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who has ended up in A&E, which is literally the worst place for you to be. Now, if there's nowhere else for you to go, you are with mental health professionals and and, and that's good. But, you know, really basic services like 24-7 crisis intervention, that's just not there. And the waiting lists are crippling people and I, I I worry that we we talk a lot about you know it's good to talk and 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 that's really important but that has to be followed up with action in relation to services because we do need to recognize you know and my my colleague um 
uh, Deputy Mark Ward uh, has written a piece of legislation basically looking for parity of esteem between mental health and physical health so that, you know, it's not constantly relegated to, uh, you know, to, to the, what's it they call it, the Cinderella of the health service, you know, that it's not always the poor relation that we would actually say, you know what, your physical health is as important as your mental health. Now, look at there's waiting lists for everything. So <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean it will, it will sort all the problems, but it does mean that it, if we start to at least recognize that it's it's not just about talking and it's not just about stigma, it's actually about being able to, to put the services in place so that the drama doesn't develop into a crisis, as I say. And I don't mean drama in a disparaging way. I mean, like, so that the small episode doesn't develop into a crisis that somebody can have that that level of intervention. I mean, you know, it, it took a, a campaign by one of the, the, the newspapers to actually get some uh, investment into services for for people with eating disorders like that and, and, and we're losing people to, to to those diseases we're losing people to addiction um you know be it gambling addiction uh drug addiction whatever we are we are losing people to substance abuse substance misuse harmful gambling all of the time and they're, they're falling between the cracks for want of a small low level intervention and that's the thing I think that's that, that is the most heartbreaking about the mental health services and I'm not saying any government could get it right overnight but they could certainly make a better effort than they have been doing up until now. Yeah yeah um, and when you pose a question upon Minister Stephen Donnelly what's his response or reasoning for that? Well you see they'll, they'll talk about the services that they are delivering and they'll talk about the, the money that they are investing and you know and there has been in the, in the last number of years an increase in the mental health budget but yeah. the unfortunate thing is I, I just I see that there is a disconnect sometimes between the, the people in government and sometimes between the HSE and the people on the ground and in terms of what's needed you know I mean you cannot 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 say to a person who is suffering with suicidal ideation here's the Samaritan's phone number go home have a cup of tea and see how you feel in the morning like, and, mm -hmm. and that has happened that has happened in in accident and emergency departments where a person was brought in having tried to jump off a bridge and they were brought into the the a and &E and they were given a phone number for the Samaritan's me wrong Samaritans are a fantastic organization yeah. they do brilliant work but if you're having an acute mental ill health episode you need a high level of intervention so and recently the, the government have uh, announced a program where they're bringing in this grade of like assistant psychologists and stuff you need people who are trained you know and yeah. that's not going to happen overnight but certainly increasing the number of people in training would be very very helpful and also you know looking at how we configure the mental health services like there's so many charities delivering so many separate little bits of of, of the service and not enough really joined up thinking but I suppose in the short term the key is when there is a a flashing blue light emergency for someone's mental health there isn't any place for them to go and yeah. that is very very worrying because that is you know and I know people talk about uh, you know about suicide as being an epidemic and and etc but that's where this ends and with the interventions that that can be put in place I'm not saying you will save every life I, I don't I don't think that's possible but yeah. I think you can actively and proactively reduce the numbers of people who arrive at that crisis point by having those uh, those type of interventions and by by listening to to people by listening to, to to survivors and listening to people who regularly use the mental health services and you can't just say oh you shouldn't be ashamed about using the mental health services you should be actually saying to them well, well come and tell me what it's like so that's what I'd like to hear from more from Minister Donnelly come and tell me what it's like come and talk to me about what it's like to be a service user in the mental health services because people have such a a, a, a mix of experiences you know some people would say oh it's great once you're in the system it's brilliant and others will say no, well it's not it's not adapting to my needs but there could be something happening in another uh, unit that might and you know and I, I just think that sometimes there's just not enough joined up thinking and I think maybe that when it comes to the hard conversations about mental health it kind of gets left to the end and yeah. you know be, people concentrate on the, the the big ticket items that will make and have a huge impact and physical health obviously is is important but when we look at mental health we don't kind of we don't think of it the same way as, as physical ill health. And I think we need to start doing that and saying to people, sometimes you need a crutch because your, your leg is sore. And sometimes you need a different form of support because you are, you know, you, you are um, suffering with mental ill health and it's 
it could be a temporary thing. So you just need you need an intervention there and then, and that's not there. And, I, and that that worries me. That's something that really really worries me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of people were saying that you know for mental health services, you pay one hundred and twenty six euro to one hundred and twenty euro, and you'll get a, a therapist, and that's fine. But not everyone has that much money to pay no. for yeah. a counselor or a session. And even if they do they're so reluctant to spend that amount like yeah. not even that I think absolutely everything should be free because that like that obviously that would be great it's, it's unrealistic yeah but okay. it's just so much like yeah. like unless you've so much spare money you wouldn't be putting it into it no and and that's the other thing as well because we, we are raised to, to kind of look after our physical health yeah and yeah. spend money on that but our, yeah. our mental health it's kind of like well a cup of tea and a pat on the head and you'll be grand yeah and whereas you know and we don't think of it as something that we invest in so we, we think about investing in our physical health because we think mm. about I'll join the gym that's good for my my physical health I might see a dietitian. I could go mm. to physio I've just finished uh, a long period uh in uh, with, with with a physio there for my back and uh, I, can, I can back running thank god uh, all the oh, people who yeah, have fun so, measuring yeah. my backside now are going to, <laughs> are going to have, they're going to have a land now but no but I mean like we we would invest in our physical health we think yeah. about that and we do think about it differently so you know I think maybe and I wouldn't advocate for people having to pay for it themselves. But again, you're talking about a low level kind of intervention, talk and therapy, one to one, you know, that, that having that available and having that available at the primary care centre, which is where mental health should be in the heart of the community, not hived off or not in the, at the back of the hospital in a little unit that you have to go down 50 yeah. corridors to get to, but actually part and parcel of community delivered healthcare. We don't have that model. And as you say, we have well I certainly have what well, well, you know was raised in an era where you just wouldn't spend 120 quid yeah you wouldn't, no you wouldn't think about it for yeah. your you know like, like if you if you needed a, a splint or something for your leg and you had to pay for it you kind of go oh, geez I need that you know yeah. but you don't think about it the same and I think that's that, that's kind of an it that is a bit of an issue and that's a that's a societal thing that we need to, to yeah. uh, you know to deal with but I do think the um you know the, the idea that people but you can only have services if you have the money to pay for them mm. that's just that goes against everything I believe in because yeah. the very people who need the services uh, could be the very ones that just don't have it and yeah. you know there, there has to be some level of availability if you're looking for a counsellor and you need again it might not be forever but if you need access to uh, counselling through your GP very often it's just and a little bit the same with with uh, physiotherapy that your GP will say to you well I put you on a waiting list and mm -hmm. you know come back to me in five years yeah. or you can go down the road and you can see this person now and you know if you're struggling to find 120 quid for one session well yeah. then you're really 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 going to struggle to find 240 quid for two sessions or 360 for three exactly. sessions and yeah, yeah. that's just not that's yeah. just not there for you and there, um, there needs it needs to be there for you yeah because it also would stop people like they're like I've been two or three times now like surely that's enough or that's worth but they might need a lot more or a lot longer but they're just doing it because of money you know that's yeah, kind of yeah. And, that, <laughs> and that that's the, that is the wrong reason yeah to decide any yeah. aspect of your health care unfortunately yeah. it, it is for too many people it is the the one thing that 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 like kind of curtails them in in terms of what yeah. they might want but it, it is the that is the wrong reason to to stop but I I, I know exactly what you're saying and I could mm. see that happening you'd have one or two sessions and you kind of think yeah I feel much better now and yeah you, well like you know another 120 quid you know I've already dipped into my overdraft <laughs> or I've yeah. I kind of maxed out my credit card for the last one ah sure I'd be grand I've had yeah yeah, yeah I've had I've had the, and you're kind of sitting there going just you know give me some coping tips for the next while mm. whereas like actually having access to it and I think sometimes the, the government worry oh if we gave people access to it you know they're, 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 they'd we'd be overrun but yeah like that's the chances are they wouldn't be overrun you know but again if they're not talking to the people who are regularly using the mental health services then they, they don't really have an understanding of of what it, the lived reality is yeah. for you know for individuals which I think mm -hmm. is, is probably a bad thing yeah and is there a shortage of counsellors and psychologists or what's the issue there why can't why is there strong waiting lists well yeah yes there, there is a shortage but then also uh and you probably saw there a couple of years ago nurses went on strike doctors yeah. were balloting for industrial action as well there is a, a kind of a 
that we lose a lot of our trained mental health professionals to emigration yeah. for the simple reason that we do a bloody good job in educating them. They come mm-hmm. out with really strong, brilliant qualifications and England is calling, Australia is calling, Dubai is calling and, and they're being snapped up and, uh, you know, America, Canada, like English speaking countries that, and they're being snapped up and they're being given m- more tools to do the job that they need that the more tools that they need to do the job in other places they're respected more they maybe work shorter hours they get better paid so all of these things we're, we're competing against a, a global shortage of healthcare professionals in some areas but I do think you know we could look at opening up more training places making maybe a bit of online training available as well to kind of boost the numbers but if you look at say the, the way this government say the, the minister for education recently was in the paper saying that, that it, uh, we're going to end up with an oversupply of teachers, you know, because of the numbers going through teacher training college, we're going to end up with an oversupply, like we're not. We're going to end up with the opportunity to have smaller class sizes. If you yeah. want to look at it that way, more yeah. teachers, smaller classes, that's a good idea. Mm. Whereas the, the it seems the Minister for, for Education, and she's reflective of the rest of the government, she's looking at this and going, oh no, we're going to end up with too many teachers. It's like, well, what about the possibility of, you know, smaller classes? rooms smaller classrooms smaller class sizes and so I think it's a little bit the same it's like well geez we don't educate too many psychologists now because then we'll have too many of them and it's like well, yeah. we have a need we have a real impressing need so I think there is a need to, to up the numbers that are going into uh, the mental health area to study mental health and I think also I think we need to look at the number of small charities that are delivering services locally not that they're not doing a good job but maybe you know with a bit of consolidation they might be able to get some economies of scale and deliver the service better you know so there's an awful lot of that as well as an awful lot of outsourcing that the government are paying money for the delivery of mental health services that they don't actually control so they're giving money to small charities to the private sector and they don't actually control that so it's hard to fit that into a strategy then because you know because they don't control every aspect of it and I think that as well I'd like to see them take more of that work in-house give people those permanent jobs give them the same terms and conditions that the public service get and and ensure that you know we have a a stronger foundation to build on for our mental health professionals because we can't do it without them and look at the the mental health professionals are not everything I know that I know some people are very anti that kind of medical model that that we tend to have but they are a part of the picture there's other stuff obviously but they, they are a part of the picture and they're missing because we're not uh, we're not educating enough of them I think at the moment and I think we could do an awful lot better than than that and also like things like apprenticeships and stuff so the minister for for education is talking a lot about new apprenticeships and yeah. how we can do that like maybe that's an area that we could look at and again it's not something I've, I've thought a huge amount about but I think it is an area that maybe we could look at saying okay it, is there a, an apprenticeship type model that might work yeah. you know so that someone would learn on the job particularly uh, maybe for for older workers who have experience but don't necessarily have um the, the, they might want to do an apprenticeship but they wouldn't have experience in that area so they might be thinking oh, I don't know if that's for me or not but that yeah. you would have the opportunity to think about it to look at it and to uh, to maybe look at an apprentice a kind of an apprenticeship program in that area or just to look a bit imaginatively at it and and try and you know generate a little bit of I don't know kind of left field thinking you know to because whatever it is that they have been doing is not working so I don't think anyone could look at the mental health services and say that you know we have everything we need yeah. so whatever it is they've been doing isn't working and maybe they need to, to to kind of examine newer uh newer ways to um you know a different approach maybe you know maybe a less medical approach and and a, and a more um community-based type approach I think is 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 maybe what's needed but again you still you're still going to need the staff and we're not educating enough of them unfortunately yeah I think it can be off-putting as well because it can cost a lot of money to become to get the qualification necessary to become a counsellor psychologist that's it two years master's and then you need to go and do your doctorate but before that you do your assistant psychologist work um and I'm sure you know we all know that the HSE advertised unpaid positions for assistant psychologists so I mean you know as my granny used to say if you work for free you'll never be idle I mean I now they did reverse that right and they they got 
they, they got quite a backlash uh, mm. in relation to that stupid idea. And it was good to see them reverse it. But should they were at the same carry on with, with student nurses? Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, like, I, I don't know. And all of this now, and I, I don't mean this disrespectfully to the man himself, and I know he works very, very hard, but the head of the HSE earns 420 grand. Like that man's not coming to work for nothing. Yeah. You know, the Minister for Health earns 185 grand. He's not coming to work for nothing. And he shouldn't come to work for nothing. But no. nobody should be expected to yeah. go to work for nothing. You yeah, know? Yeah. So it's like there 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 has to be that level of um I think that kind of showed a bit of a disrespect as well. Uh I know I know from the emails that we got into the office that uh you know that there were from people basically saying, Is this it now? Is this all that the government think that I am worth? And and people were really, really deeply upset. And rightly so, actually. They were very, very upset about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a slap in the face for people that have studied and worked so hard to get to that. Yeah. And across the board, you said nurses, midwives. Yeah. It's all kind of... Hmm. Yeah, and it's not good. I mean, as I say, I used to be a union official, but you wouldn't have to have a background in industrial relations to know that it's not a good idea to work for nothing. But then mm-hmm. again, if it's your career and if it's something you are so passionate about, you might look at that and think, you say, you know, I, I nearly would do that just to get yeah. into the area because yeah. I know people are absolutely desperate. But then you've got other people who might look at it and go, Jesus, I might do that now just to get into the area. But they simply mm-hmm. can't afford to work for nothing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, because most people work the, the same as same as I do and you do you know most people work to eat and pay the rent and pay the mortgage and do all of that kind of stuff so if you're all day working for free like yeah. when are you gonna have the time to actually earn money you don't yeah. be working all night earning money to live and then working all day in your dream job it, it was it was never gonna work but it was and it was an awful idea from the start but I think that kind of notion that you can deliver services on the cheap um I think that the government need to to give their head a bit of a wobble now on that because that's just that's not possible you know if you yeah. if you you want the services there you have to be prepared to make the investment and it's a worthwhile investment because you will save the money in the long run because you won't have people arriving into a and e in a state of absolute crisis requiring a huge massive crisis intervention you will have people who can access the service when they need it and then say that's grand thanks i'll come back if i need more i don't need it anymore and i, I think that you know sometimes it's a what's it say uh pound pound wise and penny foolish you know um, yeah. or penny wise and pound foolish that's it you know <laughs> that that the think all day about the you know the, the the big 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 money that has to be spent but not actually concentrating on where a small amount of money can be spent and make a huge amount of difference you know and in, in terms of wages and stuff for people but i do think it was a bit much to ask people to work for nothing um yeah that that was a bad move and I was glad to see that was reversed because yeah. it was a very very poor decision and it reflected badly and I know people were saying well it wouldn't happen in any area other than mental health unfortunately that's not actually true because yeah. they did try that crack with nurses general mm-hmm. nurses as well as well as mental health nurses but they did try, try that with nurses and mid with student nurses and midwives as well so yeah. you know they say mm-hmm. you work for free you'll never yeah. be idle <laughs> yeah it's like, it's like now, loads of different sectors like I'm in fashion I literally worked for two summers for free (laughs) and then at the end of it there's not even really anything it's just to have it on your CV and it's like Mm. everything that you do is just to have it on your CV but it's like when am I ever going to actually get anything from all this stuff on my CV like yeah I want to to exchange my CV for money now please please. (laughs) I have a good CV I don't need any more CV fillers I need money yeah no I I get no room left on my CV five pages long but you see this is the issue and like you know somebody and if you if you can take up an internship uh position you know that's good if you can right yeah but like a lot of people can't do you know like a lot of people just they haven't got and you know people struggle to try and do it because they say well I want the experience and I want to be able to you know I want to be able to put it on my CV to let people know I can do it but an awful lot of people can't afford to intern for nothing I mean I I believe that interns should be paid I think free internships should be consigned to the dustbin because I think you know it's one thing for a week or two to get a, a little bit of experience you know when you're in school or whatever but it's quite a, quite another thing to come in and actually be doing a job. You know, if you're doing a job, you should be paid to do that job. And, yeah, you know, if you're interning and helping I, and working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that that's kind of, and that sends a bad message to people as well about about how about how they're valued, you know, and, and about, you know, kind of, 
and I know a lot of a lot of people who they, like particularly if it's a career that you're passionate about and you you know you really and you look at it and you go geez I wouldn't like I love my job I, I would probably do my job for nothing um if I could afford to but I couldn't afford to do my job yeah. for nothing because I have to pay yeah. I have to pay me bills and you know whatever else so like that I, I think you know the the idea of paid internships I think that they can exclude so many of unpaid internships that they exclude so many people that actually they're such a bad idea that we should make it uh, it, it should be illegal to offer unpaid internships over any uh, extended period of time that actually we should have a situation whereby if you're bringing someone in if they're learning on the job and they're working then they should be even if it's only just expenses but they should have they should have money you know they should they should yeah. get money in exchange for for their work every time you Definitely, know? yeah completely agree with you like you need money to access mental health you need money to become a mental health a therapist you need money to do your dream job you need money to do freaking everything yeah. yeah yeah and I mean that's the thing and and I think we're we're seeing a kind of a more of a polarization in 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 society that you know that there's the gap between the, the the well the gap between rich and poor the gap between mm. the, the the top 10 percent and the bottom 10 percent that's getting wider and that's yeah. not good that is not good and and i don't want to see a, a situation whereby we'd be nearly writing off you know a, a percentage of the population just gone but that's it now you know they'll never get out of the situation that they're in yeah. that kind of and you know that that sort of postcode lottery i was born in in, in bali farmers i know growing up loads of the the fellas on my road uh, I, I lived on London Road like they would use their granny's address or someone else's address yeah. because you lived on London Road you weren't getting a job anywhere like you just weren't yeah. you know if you had Dublin 10 down uh, as, as your postcode you weren't getting a job and I just think sometimes maybe maybe politicians maybe not all politicians they kind of write off certain elements uh, you know certain postal areas certain elements of, of of our society and I think that that that's wrong and one of the ways that you do that is to put that barrier in place it's like well you can only have your dream job if you can afford to work for a year um, yeah. and and get no money and also not be able to draw the dole so you know I mean that like that that's effectively gatekeeping that keeps people out of work that they want that they'd be good at that they that they would mm. enjoy that mm. they would excel at that keeps them out of that and it, it's a kind of an elitist thing so I, I I would be very much in favor of paid internships for people and as you, you say you, you shouldn't have to need all this money to do your dream job because if you have a passion for something you're probably going to be good at it if someone had just yeah. give you the chance you know mm. yeah so you're missing out on all these gems that are so passionate about yeah. what they do and you just mm. Right yeah. Off, you know. yeah that's it and and you are you're you know you're you're walking past people if you are the ceo of a of a corporation you're walking past people in the street who you've already written off because they can't afford to work but they might be the best thing to, to happen to your company they could be the best thing to since the slice pan but you know if you don't give people a chance you know you're you're losing out yourself but people don't see yeah. it like that you know the yeah but it is a barrier it's a very effective barrier to people getting into I mean getting into education is tough we have the highest fees of any country yeah. in the OECD that's a, it's about three grand I think it is for an undergrad that's insane yeah. um I've just as, as by way of an anecdote now, I'm much older than than either of you but when I was in college I uh there wasn't free fees um and my fees were about half what they are now yeah so my, my paid fees for I, I I studied in UCD I paid fees but by the time my daughter came to go to UCD the fees we, I, we had free fees or so we were told and it was more than I paid when I paid fees so yeah. I mean I would let that, and that's adjusted for inflation everything else so like the uh, that's a that is a barrier that's a serious barrier to people yeah. to uh, being able to to go and if the message yeah. for young people is unless you have money uh, unless you're lucky enough to be born um you know to, to parents who have a good few bob well then mm. that's it you're just right you're just written off that's the wrong message and that's why yeah. when, when we talked at the last election about the politics of change that's the kind of stuff you want to change that's yeah. you know you you want to make sure that every person born on this island gets a decent chance gets a fair chance gets an opportunity um you know to to do their dream job or to yeah. to just simply do a job that they enjoy where they're respected and, and you know where they can make that contribution because I genuinely believe that's all people want is a chance you know? yeah yeah for sure um so I know we're we've only got 15 minutes left yes, I'm, um, very, I'm very chatty so sorry about that. no it's all it's so it's so interesting yeah like it's it's all really good um stuff and it's really interesting to see your point of views it's um similar to ours you know 
And it's it's refreshing to hear that someone in government hears what you're saying, hears what the young people are saying, yeah. and understands and wants to change it. Yeah, it's you know, the change the change is the key. I I have a a five year old grandson now, and I look at him and I just think I want you to have every opportunity. I yeah. never. I know. Same with my daughter. <clears throat> And my daughter's happy. She's a good job. Um, she works damn hard, uh, you know, to, to to bring up her son and to, uh, you know, to keep to, to keep it all together. But I look at same as I did with my with my daughter. I look I look at my grandson. And I just think I want you to have every chance. Not every chance that I can buy you. Not every chance yeah. that you know that your that your mom can buy you or that that my parents can buy. But I want you to be born into a place where you have a chance where you can work hard and that you will get a reward for that yeah. where you can live a decent life you know where he can aspire to own a house that's something that I, I bought a house when I was 20 I didn't buy it my own myself and my husband yeah we bought our house when I was 24 and it wasn't that outrageous we're probably the first of our friend group to mm. uh, to buy a house but it wasn't that outrageous what people didn't yeah. think you know whoa my daughter's like my daughter's 25 and she will tell you it, it gets further and for the, the the notion of that mm. and it's not that you, you want to purchase a house because you want a big property empire it's the stability that that brings you and mm. that gives you that kind of uh, that security that it gives you knowing that you can live somewhere permanently and that you're not going to be moved. And I mean, like when my young one was, by the time before fifth birthday, I think we had lived in maybe seven separate addresses because that's what renting in Dublin was like. You, you, yeah. you bobbed around and I didn't want that anymore. And I said to my husband, I don't care if we can't technically afford it. We are just going to get our head down. And But we could do that. You know, that yeah. that was an option for us. That's not an option for young people. And, and that's why when, when we talk about change, that's the sort of stuff we want to change. It's not, you know, it's not everyone to be a millionaire, but you just want everyone to have normal yeah. aspirations, like for ordinary people to just aspire to, well, like what well, well, the kind of stuff that we had, that our parents had, that, that would be very, very normal, a secure place to live, somewhere to go to school, food in your belly, you know, uh, money for small things. Like these kinds of things, I, I worry sometimes that there's there's a generation coming behind me that regard those type of things as a luxury, and that really that 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 scares me because I I think actually we're we're better than that, and we should be better than that definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I can relate to that. I'm 24, turning 25 next month, still living at home, and uh, the thoughts of me getting a house is just beyond. I can't even think of it. Like I yeah. Yeah. no and, and, and you know you, you will because uh change is coming that's yeah. there's nothing more certain change is coming because it has to because we like we can't actually just accept oh, sorry there's my cat we, <laughs> we can't actually just accept that the world is set up like that that yeah. it's normal to pay two and a half grand a month in rent and not be able yeah. to afford to to save up to buy a deposit for a house we're just not accepting that you yeah, know yeah. I I'm not I'm not writing off home ownership uh for for my daughter or for my grandson I'm saying and not that owning your house is to be all and end all but having somewhere secure to live so I was talking to my dad at the weekend and 50 odd years ago my dad was a member of the Dublin Housing Action Committee and they I mean that they, they had they, they took like fairly direct action on the streets of Dublin city and as a result the government were forced to embark on a house building program and uh, and um, they, 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 they built houses people needed houses particularly in Dublin there was a huge crisis in Dublin but the demands that they had 50 odd years ago now it was 1969 it was 52 years ago this year the demands that they had were very similar to the demands that you hear that, that 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 we would have now that you hear people saying you know like a fair rent uh the opportunity to buy a house the you know like the the opportunity to, to live somewhere decent and you know not to like i and i was saying to my dad we were chatting about it at the weekend and i said to him Geez, i said i don't even ask people anymore what their housing situation is because people like what what i would have considered to, to be normal you know that that you that you, like when i was growing people didn't live at home they they moved yeah. out you mean like I, I moved out when i was whatever nearly 20 so like people moved out it wasn't but they could afford to it was more it was usual that was that was a, i don't yeah. ask people anymore where they live or because i i'm meeting more and more people 
who are I met, met a woman a couple of weeks ago and she lives in Cork she works three days a week in Dublin so she works 12 to 14 hour shifts and she comes up she takes the bus overnight she works all day stays in a hostel for two nights and then comes back on the on the night bus down to Cork because she can't afford Dublin rent that's I'm not going I'm not going to say what that is because that's not a nice word to use on your podcast but it is that and it's not right and it has to change because I Mm -hmm. and like I'm at stage I don't even ask people anymore what their what their home situation is because you just don't know and people are living in overcrowded situations they're living in appalling circumstances and then people are putting their whole life on hold like I have uh, friends and, and and they've they've moved back into their parents because they, they, they just couldn't afford Dublin rent or they're saving up to buy a yeah. house or I have friends whose kids have moved back in and mm-hmm. and they're kind of they're trying to save up to buy. I mean it's it's not it's not right but it will change that there is nothing more certain than we as a people will not put up with this we just won't (laughs) there's like we we will demand people will demand action and they will just demand really simple things like houses are built like waiting lists are dealt with kind of stuff that we should be able to do you know we are a a wealthy country um you know and we should be able to, to to look after those people who need it and who are already working hard and paying for it you know how do you think we're going to be able to improve the situation? Change of government. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell you, I tell you this much, right? Yeah. One thing I can absolutely guarantee, one hundred percent, with my hand on my heart, if we keep doing the same stuff that we have been doing for the last uh, thirty years or more we yeah. will keep getting the same results yeah so you know when when we talk about change we talk about change in politics to switch it around so that the concentration is on is on the many and not the few yeah. and politics needs to deliver so like i would say we've had a go we've had a government for the banks we've had a government for builders a government for landlords a government for developers uh, a government for wealthy elites we need a government for ordinary people that mm-hmm. will you know come in and use the state's money because the state spends a lot of money we spend a lot of money on outsourcing we spend a lot of money on uh, on privatization but actually use that money to drive development at local level to drive jobs at local level to ensure that there is a community bonus for people so that where the local authority is spending money where the local university is spending money that we're creating good quality jobs because good quality jobs and access and having access to those jobs, that's the anchor that you need. You know, working, one of the things that we learned in this pandemic, and I mean, I kind of knew it anyway, but I think a lot of people maybe just realized it was the extent to which people are living uh, very precarious lives. You know, there, there was an entire chunk of our population are one paycheck away from, yeah. uh, you know, from homelessness. That, and, and that's that was scary. And the idea that they had like a huge number of people lost their jobs, but the tax take was hardly interfered with at all. So those people were hardly paying tax because yeah. they were they were working all the hours that God sends, but they weren't even making enough to pay tax. They were working in precarious, low hours contracts, all of these things. They have to change. They have to be gone. A civilized society is no place for, uh, you know, there should be no place in a civilized society for not knowing how many hours you're going to be working next week or how much yeah. money you're going to. How in the name of Jesus can you plan? How can you say, yeah. how could you sign a lease if you don't know from one week to the next how many hours you're going to be working or how much uh, you can expect to be paid? Because what are you going to say to your landlord? Well, look, at on the weeks when I do 40 hours, you'll defo get the full rent. But see, on the other weeks, I might only do three three quarters of that so yeah. it would be cool if I just gave you three quarters of the rent no is yeah. the answer so like you know we need we need to be doing that and we need to look at what we're spending money on like a billion quid was spent on on uh, housing supports last year instead of just building houses you know I mean yeah. it's it's bonkers stuff some of it is just yeah. is bonkers so like the change has to be driven from the top absolutely um yeah. and we need as I've said we need a government for ordinary people because we have had a government that has delivered we've had successions of governments that have delivered for developers and landlords and speculators and you know wealthy business people we need a government that delivers for ordinary people that's yeah simple as that just because ordinary people don't like people they don't, it's not that they don't want much but, but but people want what we will consider like basics you know the somewhere secure to live access to a decent job you know the, the opportunity to work bloody hard and yeah. you know and save and do all of those other things so then they, they shouldn't be mad aspirations at all yeah yeah um and i guess this is probably our final second last question 
what policies does Sinn Féin have in place for the health or the housing sector and for mental health? Okay, so our housing policy, obviously better articulated by Owen O'Brien than me, but uh, it's to double the capital investment in housing, um, which be, basically means build houses. Uh, yeah. That you know that the state should be building houses. We want to stop uh, vulture funds buying up these houses because, in some yeah. instances, they are renting them back to the state, which is yeah. insane. It's absolutely yeah. insane. So we want to double the capital investment in uh, in, in public housing. We also want to ensure that public land that we make good use of public land, that we don't gift public land to developers in sweetheart deals, that we actually look, it's it's the only thing we're not making any more of is land. So we need to look at what we have and we need to build sustainable communities on the land that we have at the moment instead of these sweetheart deals to, to private developers. With regard to mental health, our policy is, is our, well, we have loads of detailed policy, but just in, in broad terms, parity of esteem. You know, it's it no longer the uh, the last line in the budget, no longer the Cinderella of the uh, of the health service, but actually, you know, uh, valued and treated the same as physical. And some people would say, which well, is, we don't do much on the physical health side either. But there there is much more of a concerted effort on the on the physical health side, so that we would have that parity of esteem. And and you know, yeah, it's important that we all have the language and we all talk about our mental health, and that's really really good but actually recognising that there are times when people will need an intervention and how can we as a state intervene at the earliest possible stage so that people don't end up in crisis and that's where we'd like to see the bulk of the investment go. So that's your crisis intervention teams, yes, but it's also your counselling service, the, the idea that you would have access to a GP and from that you'd have access to a certain number of counselling sessions you know the, the stuff like that I think would make yeah. a huge huge difference in the everyday experience of people and I think that's what we need to maybe switch the focus on mental health around to not on the the 15 to 20 year uh, idea but actually can we make a difference in people's lives right now can we make it easier for them to live safer for them to live uh, you know can we ensure that people can just get get back on with their with their lives that you know that that having an episode of mental ill health does not mean that you then have an episode of prolonged unemployment but that you yeah. can get the help you need and you can get back to work I, I think that don't think that's outrageous I think that's uh you know that that makes that that makes a lot of sense yeah mm-hmm. definitely like simple simple sort of <laughs> basic thing get like, the basics right just yeah. get the basics right yeah, yeah. Well, Louise, thank you so, so much for coming on. Yeah, it's been a pleasure and it's been so interesting. And uh, I, we could have talked for hours yeah, there, but um, I can't believe it's been an I'm hour glad already. It flew, it, that really flew, didn't it? Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. no, I, I am I am very chatty, so. No, that's, that's <laughs> love it. Yeah, yeah, it's a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good. It's been really, really, really nice now to, to have this opportunity. And I want to thank you very much for asking me because uh, mm-hmm. this is the kind of thing I like to do, but, you know, maybe you, you don't get asked as often maybe as, as you'd like. And this has yeah. been really, really interesting and thank you and uh, I, I've enjoyed it listen back to a few of your podcasts I've enjoyed them so oh, fair play oh. to you keep it up <laughs> brilliant well, thank you so much and thanks for listening guys